everyone. Welcome to this event with 1871. Thank you for joining us. Um, if you are new to 1871 and this is your first event with us and you don't know that much about us, we are Chicago's technology hub and the number one ranked private business incubator in the world. We exist to inspire, equip, and support founders, growth scalers, and innovators in building extraordinary businesses. We have about 450 technology startups, a little over 400 growth stage companies, and 1,500 members. And we're supported by an entire ecosystem focused on accelerating their growth and creating jobs in the Chicagoland area. Today, you're joining us for Construct, Testing Your Product and Business Model, a conversation with Cheryl Kemp, founder and chief exercise officer of IndieFit. So welcome, Cheryl. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, would you want to start by just providing um, some high-level details about yourself, a little introduction and some background? Yeah, happy to. So my background is primarily in go-to-market strategy and primarily in the food tech world. So I started the earliest part of my career in restaurant marketing, and then around 2013 got really interested in the way that food delivery was sort of emerging and, and changing the restaurant world. So I became a very early employee at a startup called Order Up, which was ultimately acquired by Groupon. That's what brought me to Chicago about four years ago. And at Groupon, I led go-to-market strategy for several new product launches, including food delivery, salon and spa booking, and card-linked offers. And then most recently led enterprise partnerships at Ritual, which is a social food ordering app. Um, outside of all of that, professionally, I'm a huge group fitness enthusiast and have been for a long time. So I've always been the person who's maxing out my class pass account, dragging friends to fitness studios all over the city, and just been a really big part of my life. Um, so like many, I was laid off in April when COVID got a little crazy for all of us. And, you know, this is, of course, around the same time that the fitness industry had sort of turned upside down. And so enter IndieFit. I'm now two months into a new adventure as the founder and CEO of IndieFit, which is a platform that empowers fitness instructors and trainers to earn more by hosting their own outdoor and virtual classes independently. Awesome. Um, so you're a new founder. You've worked at startups and um, kind of new t businesses, but this is your first business that you're founding. Um, let's kind of start with a broad question of how, what do you love or what have you been finding kind of gratifying about becoming a founder? Yeah, so many things. Um, so I'll answer this question in two ways. I guess first on a personal level, you know, this has been something that I've wanted to do basically my whole life. And I think for a lot of people, entrepreneurship is this sort of like vague end goal, but it's really easy to let obstacles get in your way, whether it be, you know, it's not the right time, I don't have the right idea, the right team, not enough money in the bank, whatever it may be. Um, so for me, I mean, I've jokingly called myself a wantrepreneur for many years. And so it's been really gratifying to, to just do it, so to speak. And I'm learning a lot more than I ever have in my career. And, you know, with regard to specifically IndieFit, we're a very mission driven business. And so for me, you know, a big part of the reason that I'm excited to build this company specifically is actually helping fitness instructors and trainers and shifting power dynamics and earning potential in the industry. So it's been really rewarding, you know, on a, on a personal level to see little signs that that's starting to happen. So something as simple as a fitness instructor sending me, you know, a photo of a packed class in the evening and saying, Oh my gosh, you know, 12 people came tonight. I just made $200. I'm thrilled. So it's been great. Awesome. Can you talk a little bit more? I mean, you mentioned launching just a couple months ago. Can you talk a little bit more about how you put together your team and launched a working MVP in basically a month? Yeah, basically a month is right. <laughs> so I, I had a crazy path to starting this company. So as I mentioned, you know, it all started with a layoff in April. And there was actually another speed bump in the process before I landed in the seat that I'm in today. And that was that I had actually received and accepted a different job offer. So I was going to go work at Uber. I had an official start date. Everything was, you know, sort of signed, sealed and delivered. And because of the craziness of COVID, they unexpectedly went into a hiring freeze. And ultimately that offer was rescinded. 
So what resulted was me getting into this headspace of, you know, this is a temporary setback. This is still where I'm going to end up. It's just going to take a couple of months. And so I decided to fill my time with some consulting and I've always loved, you know, early stage startups. So I started connecting with a couple of founders and just kind of offering my services, you know, to, to help them. And the interesting byproduct of that was that, you know, by talking to early stage founders every day, I started to get in this headspace of, huh, like, why am I not doing this? Maybe this is the time. It's as good a time as any. And around that same time, I got connected to an incredible woman named Sarah Koontz, who runs Clio Capital in San Francisco. And she was creating a really cool program called Chrysalis, which was basically designed to create an environment where people who had been laid off as a result of COVID, who had an interest in starting a company, could all gather together, have access to resources and mentorship, and think about doing that. So I enrolled in this program without an idea, without a team, just open-minded. <laughs> and very surprisingly to even myself, I came out of the six-week program with a legally incorporated and launched company. Um, so for us, you know, when, when we thought about once this specific idea emerged, we really recognized that, you know, while COVID has created challenges for some companies, for us, COVID had actually created the perfect market conditions for success. So you have a lot of fitness instructors and trainers who are either laid off or underemployed. You have, you know, users looking for safe and flexible ways to work out. So we knew we needed to move fast. So as I'm in this program, once the idea, you know, had really come to me and I felt strongly about it and had flushed it out, I recognized that I was going to have to make really major decisions. Who is the team? What is the product? and make them really, really fast. <laughs> and so um, we did all of that. So I actually met my co-founders in that Chrysalis program and we're definitely um, an, an untraditional story in the sense that there are four of us who started the company together. We have never met and we are in New York, LA, Chicago, and Berlin of all places. And it's funny because I think, you know, while I probably would have always imagined starting a company with ex-colleagues or friends or, you know, somebody who I've known longer than three weeks on the internet. Um, what I learned very quickly is that when you really think about the formula for building a great team and what you really need in a co-founder, you actually can probe for that in a very short period of time if you ask the right questions. So what we did was basically, um, you know, connect over Zoom. I have a really amazing resource um, that I'd be happy to share in the chat if anybody's interested of an article that was basically 50 questions to ask a potential co-founder. And so I met people through this program and by asking a series of the right questions and probing for, you know, complementary skill sets, but common values, a similar vision for the long-term trajectory of the company and the ultimately excitement about this specific idea. I was able to find, you know, the right people and took that leap of faith and two months in, it's, it's going great. <laughs> that's so amazing. I, that's really interesting because I was going to ask you how you were able to sort of build rapport with people that you hadn't really met in person so quickly and develop that level of trust. So that series of questions um, is really great and helpful. Um, as you developed your go-to-market strategies, what about the product and your business model did you learn? Because you, like you mentioned, you were making all those decisions really fast. Um, what kind of things were you learning along the way and, and sort of adjusting for? Yeah, I mean, I think our primary mechanism for learning was talking to potential customers. And so my philosophy on this was fall in love with the problem first and foremost, not the solution. And so when we set out to start IndieFit, what we knew was that fitness instructors and trainers historically have been squeezed in the value chain of studios and gyms. The earning potential in the industry is not what it should be. And ultimately the power dynamics are kind of backwards. So that was the core problem that we became obsessed with. But when we were thinking about the business model, there was a software version of this business model. There was a version where this was SaaS and it was all about building tooling for instructors. And then there was a marketplace version. There was a version where it was all about connecting instructors to local clients and then, you know, having a, a take rate on that transaction because we're a source of incrementality for them. 
So when we talked to fitness instructors, we didn't really know exactly which of those two roads we would go down. But when we started having these conversations, what we realized is we kept hearing the same two things. When we asked instructors, you know, what the pain points were with teaching independently or why they didn't do it, it was always, I'm not a marketer. How will I find clients? Number one thing on their mind was always, I don't know how to generate my own demand. And the second thing was always, physically, where will I teach? So a studio or a gym is putting a roof over your head. In the absence of that relationship, where do you hold the class? Mm -hmm. And so once we had enough of those conversations, it became very apparent that software and, and technology and tooling isn't what was exciting instructors. It was the prospect of us being a source of demand and new clients and helping to connect them to spaces that they could teach. So ultimately our business model emerged as kind of a three-sided marketplace that connects clients, independent instructors and trainers and spaces that they can teach. And that could be an event space, an apartment building, office building, sort of untraditional locations where they can pop up. Very cool. So when you launched and you were doing all of this really quickly, you were getting this feedback, you launched the product. Um, what kind of feedback have you gotten and how have you been implementing that? What, are, what do you kind of future iterations of IndieFit look like? Yeah, I mean, I think one thing we learned after we launched was how important it is to super, super narrowly define the target market. And I think initially we didn't do this well. So if you had asked me in May, who is your target customer? I would have said, fitness instructors and trainers, right? There's 400,000 of them. And now my philosophy on this is go after 99% of a grape, not 1% of a watermelon. You know, pick the segment of the addressable supply base that really makes sense and focus on them. And so if you ask me the same question today, now I would tell you, you know, we're really focused on fitness instructors who already teach independently in some capacity, usually have an Instagram following between two to 10,000 people and likely teach yoga <laughs> because we've learned that's the category we've had the most success in. Um, so we're much more focused and more intentional about who we're targeting at this point. And ultimately the impact of that is that we're working a little bit smarter instead of harder. So right now the primary way that we connect with instructors and trainers is via direct sales. So we contact them on Instagram, reach out with a DM, and then ultimately try to get them on the phone, um, you know, to chat more about IndieFit and the benefits for them. And so because we're targeting, you know, the right segment at this point, we're seeing a lot better yield um, on those reach outs. So you joined 1871 and became a member of Pyros about something over the summer. Um, what have you kind of experienced through joining that community and um, the workshops and things like that? What have you sort of learned and been able to implement or what are you looking forward to? What's kind of the um, kind of your hope in joining this community? Yeah, it's, it's been incredible. I mean, even in a short period of time, I, I think my, my mental health, first of all, would probably not be as good without 1871 because a, a big part of this community is just that, it's the community. It's you know being surrounded by other founders, people sitting in the same seat that I am who truly understand the pain points and believe me, there are pain points, um, really understand them in a way that you know perhaps friends of mine who have never done this don't. And so I've met so many other founders. I, I really appreciate the genuine desire to help one another, even if it's something as simple as, you know, hey, you're doing something really cool this week. Let me share it for you on Instagram. Something as simple as that, all the way to, you know, maybe getting on for a brainstorming session or making a relevant introduction or anything like that. So the support system has been incredible. I think the other thing I would say is access to mentors. And my experience with that is, you know, it's the, the program is really what you make of it. You certainly do have to be proactive in terms of, you know, taking advantage of all the incredible resources that are being put in front of you. So I've been very active. I actually try to do it close to every week, been very active about taking advantage of speaking to mentors, reaching out, paying attention to, you know, who is in this Rolodex of, of amazing folks that we have access to. Um, I built an amazing personal relationship with Rachel. I'm sure there's, you know, plenty of other people on the line who are also her biggest fan, just as I am. And yeah, I mean, ultimately, it's, it's the combination of all of those things that makes me feel like I'm, you know, not alone in this journey and have incredible resources and people by my side. 
Yeah, I love that you bring up our mentors. I think that the companies and people that we see most be most successful coming through our programming definitely take advantage of, of the mentor opportunities and, and people's expertise. Um, what has been in your experience with different mentors through 1871 or otherwise, what have there been any sort of standout moments with mentors that have just like helped make certain things click for you? Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to plug um, JC Garrett. I'm not sure if anybody else has, has spoken with him, but first of all, I was blown away because we put a 30 minute conversation on the calendar and I think we were on the phone for like two hours or something wild. Like the conversation just kept flowing. Um, he really helped us form our philosophy around technology. And so the context for why I reached out to him is I was really feeling like based on the skill sets present on our founding team, we had a little bit of a blind spot for technology. So we were a team of four who all had very business heavy backgrounds. And I had this idea in my mind of, you know, we're, we're a tech company, right? And we don't have a tech person. Like, what are we going to do about that? And so I, I reached out to JC and ultimately he made me feel so much better about it because what we walked through together was this idea that there's two types of companies. There's tech centric companies and tech enabled companies. And in, in fact, very few companies are actually tech centric unless you're building something deeply proprietary or you're building, you know, a, a deep tech company, which I am not. Um, you're probably more often than not a tech enabled company. And that really helped me to see clearly that, you know, sure, technology is part of what helps us deliver our value proposition to instructors at IndieFit, but it isn't our product. Ultimately, our product is empowerment. It's access to demand. It's the benefits that instructors receive by working with us. And so to that end, this is part of how we got into market really quickly because we actually built our product on a no code platform called share drive and this is a topic that i can kind of talk about all day if, if anyone is in a position where they're they're thinking about this and needs any advice but there's kind of this whole new sector of platforms out there that allow companies to get started really quickly with access to no code tools and so what we realized was as a marketplace business, you know, the, the nuts and bolts of what we needed from a technology standpoint didn't actually look that different than any other marketplace business out there. And so by getting on this platform, we sort of optimized for speed to market and we focused on letting technology do, you know, the bare minimum that we needed it to, but not be something that was overcomplicated and prevented us from getting into market quickly. And again, all of this started with, with a chat with JC. So wonderful resource. Awesome. What is next for IndieFit as you sort of plan for the rest of the summer and into fall and winter? Yeah. So this week, actually, we are running something really exciting. We're, we're on, let's see, I guess day five now out of seven. So we partnered with Paws Chicago, who is the largest no-kill shelter in the Midwest and actually one of the largest in the country. And they've had a very strange year because they've adopted out more dogs in a short period of time during COVID than basically ever in history. And a lot of their fundraising sources have been disrupted. So normally they're raising money via, you know, the Chicago Marathon, lots of in-person events. And so we saw an interesting opportunity to work with them in the form of a fitness fundraiser where outdoor and virtual classes raise money for paws. So what we've been doing this week is instructors have volunteered to teach the classes that are featured. Um, and then 100% of the proceeds from classes all go to pause. And they've been an incredible resource in terms of helping us promote this. So it's also been, as a very early stage company that's two months old, really rewarding to get that, you know, marketing and promotion from them. So if anybody's interested in a workout in the next three days, you still have uh, plenty of opportunities to, to come support that event. Um, and, and then beyond that, you mentioned fall and winter. And so we, we have some really interesting decisions to make in the next couple of weeks, because right now the majority of our bookings are for outdoor fitness classes. Mm -hmm. So it's Chicago, right? We're only a few months away from Siberia. <laughs> so we recognize that the outdoor portion of our business is going to have to move somewhere else. So we're starting to think through what does that look like? Does that look like doubling down on virtual? Does that look like introducing the bookable space aspect of our business, which of course there, we just have to be very aware of, of what sensitivities exist in the context of COVID. Um, so there's some pivots ahead. So we're, we're in the early planning stages of surveying instructors and customers to kind of learn more 
about what their plans are from a fitness standpoint in the fall and winter and adapting and, and making sure that we can continue growing at the same trajectory, even if it looks a little different. That's great. I did my first indie fit class on Wednesday, a uh, yoga class in a park. And I was like, I wish I had known about this all summer. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm going to have one last question for you, but I just want to let everyone who's tuned in to know that we are going to do Q and a right after this. So start putting questions into the Q and a in the bottom. I know there's a couple in there, but um, go ahead and add more. So lastly, just what advice would you give someone who is developing their first product and business model? Yeah. So first and foremost, talk to your customers early, often, every day. <laughs> so when you're thinking about the idea, don't get too far down the road scoping it until you talk to who your target customer is. And then of course, even after you've launched and you're in the whirlwind of running a company and the, the 900 hats that we're wearing as founders, it's really important to prioritize this time to actually like get on the phone and speak to customers. Um, for us, I mean, I think we've as a team taken probably close to a hundred phone calls with instructors between the market research that we did and the fact that we now continue to actually pitch them on the phone in terms of getting them on board on IndieFit. And fortunately for us, these are conversations I really enjoy. Like instructors tend to be high energy, charismatic, lovely people who want to help others. Um, but really, I think the majority of what steered our original business model and the, the pivots and, and adaptations we continue to make have come from conversations with fitness instructors. So that would be thing number one. Um, I would also say perfect is the enemy of good you know, just getting into market quickly. And, and perhaps you don't have to do it in four weeks like we did, because I, I don't know if I would recommend that. I don't think any of my team slept for four weeks. Um, but I can promise you that the velocity of learning that you will have as a founder will only increase after you've launched. And so sure, you can, you can talk to customers and do research and start to, to learn pre-launch, but nothing is as powerful as real data and real market validation in terms of really determining that you've achieved product fit and, and where to go in the future. Um, there's actually, it's funny, a, an early member of our team, I, I was guilty of this, right? Like I was the perfectionist. I was the one who was like, we can't launch yet because we need to fix this tiny thing. An early member of our team used to always say to me this Reed Hoffman quote, which was, if you aren't embarrassed by the first version of your product, you didn't launch it soon enough. <laughs> And that's sort of become my mantra. I was like, I need to like needle point this and hang it on the wall so that I see it every day. Um, but, but really, I would say just go for it. Get into market quickly, optimize for speed. You'll, you'll just start learning even faster. And I guess the last thing I would say is trust the process, excuse me, trust the process and don't get discouraged. Um, and I think this is advice to myself as well. Um, there are just so many tough moments that every business is inevitably going to have in the early days. There's, there's the moment where you launch and nothing happens and you're like, oh God, what did we do? Where are the customers? There's the first time you make a major mistake and you have to apologize to your customers. You know, there's always going to be these, these hard things that are just part of the process. And I think zooming out, reminding yourself why you did it and reminding yourself that it's all just part of the journey um, is, is super important. And on that note, I, I do want to plug one really good book um, that might be relevant for anyone who's, who's in a similar position to us, and that's The Hard Thing About Hard Things. Um, I actually read this book for the first time in, I think, 2013, because the CEO of a company I formerly worked with was obsessed with it. But I picked it back up recently because it popped into my head one day, and I was like, wow, I, I remember loving this book, and it's going to be newly relevant to me now, now that I'm on this different journey. And it basically is a book about embracing the struggle. And it really double clicks into some of the things that are uniquely very difficult about building a business that, that aren't necessarily glamorous or sexy. So often don't get a lot of airtime. And I've found that it's just an incredible read as an early founder. Awesome. Thank you. Um, one question we have here is kind of a piggyback a little bit on the advice that you were just giving. Um, sort of specifically around prioritizing time for anyone and everyone, like when you were making all these decisions and you were moving really quickly, how did you sort of focus and like, and be able to sort of prioritize where to put your energy in? And 
how to build those connections and, and those things. Yeah. Focus is super important. And I think I'm still not an expert at this. I think I'm still learning um, how, how to do this well as a founder. I think for me, one thing that was really helpful and, and could probably be replicated in any company is just using the, the team dynamics of a company to hold each other accountable. And so I think we created a culture very early on where our team feels comfortable saying anything to one another. And so if someone's going down a rabbit hole in a meeting that just feels like this is not the most important thing for us to be focused on, I think we all feel comfortable saying that to one another. And, and I've had it pointed out to me plenty of times by other members of my team. And I actually appreciate hearing that feedback. And so I think it's, it's human nature to, to be, you know, all over the place. And as a founder, there's, you know, no shortage of squirrels to chase. And so it's really about holding each other accountable and, and really establishing team alignment. And so, you know, even, even though we're very early, we created what was a pretty formal meeting cadence as a company from week one. And it felt a little bit silly to be doing these meetings as if we were like, a 200 person company having an all hands, but it allowed us to really start every week by putting on paper, what are we focused on this week? And this can't be 10 things, this needs to be two things. And, and once you start your week with that intention, it's really easy to examine how you're spending your time and compare it to this yardstick of, okay, where did we say we were gonna be focused and are we actually doing that? Cool. Can you share a little bit more about the original program that you went to where you met your co-founders? We've had a few questions of like just what the name was of it and kind of what it looked like. Yeah, it, so the woman who ran it was Sarah Kuntz. Um, her last name is spelled K-U-N-S-T. And she's incredible. I mean, she's become such a, a role model and mentor for me. And she runs a pre-seed um, kind of like micro VC firm in San Francisco. And so for her, you know, she's newer in the VC world and I think is exceptional in terms of being the type of investor who genuinely wants to help founders. And so for her, this whole program started as a coffee chat. It was, was her and another colleague named Matt Walker, who also was very involved in the program. And they were just having a chat about, you know, downturns in the economy spur innovation. What, what do you think the next great company of tomorrow is going to be? Who's going to be starting it? And ultimately where their conversation led was this idea that there's this notion of like, it's time to build. Everybody's supposed to be starting companies right now because it's an economic downturn, but there aren't enough people focused on meeting entrepreneurs in the earliest stages of that process. And the earliest stages of that process are like, maybe I'll do it, maybe I won't, I don't even have an idea. Not enough people focus on, you know, fostering idea generation and helping you do the early stages of that. So I was very appreciative for a program that felt like it was speaking to exactly where I was. And the program, by I didn't answer the question properly. The, the name of the program was Chrysalis. <laughs> and it, it occurred in, I think it kicked off in like early May, ended in early June, but it was a big success. And I think that they're now trying to formulate some, some ideas around how they make it more of a living resource. So I'm not sure if this is a program that will be repeated, but I know that it is top of mind for her right now to think about what is an ongoing version of this that we could run potentially. Cool. Back to um, sort of a market strategy question. How would you say your market strategy changed pre, pre and post launch? Yeah, I mean, I think pre-launch everything is purely hypothetical. <laughs> so I think the biggest thing that has changed is we now have real data to learn from and data is a funny thing when you're a brand new company because like i said i come from groupon ritual these you know series c plus companies data at a company of that size is like let me open looker let me open tableau and here's all of the data ready to be analyzed data for an early stage company is like not clean not easily accessible not easily assembled into anything meaningful so Bless my co-founder, Scott, who I think is on the call. He literally exports these like horrendous CSV documents that come out of ShareTribe and puts them in Excel and works his wizardry to try to assemble them into something we can actually learn from. But we've, we've kind of cracked the code on that. So, so we are being very data-driven. And I think a lot of surprising insights came out of that data. And so one really big example of that is 
we leaned so much into this idea that IndieFit was going to be this like totally flexible, easy option for consumers. It was going to be very different than I have a gym membership or I have a class mess membership because we felt like people were craving flexi flexibility in the context of this pandemic. I think what we've learned in the data is there's a reason that you know subscription models are common in the fitness industry so right now one problem that we're trying to crack is customers not being sticky and thinking through how we structure the offering in a way that creates a little bit more skin in the game and better economics and one example of what that's likely going to look like is selling bundles so rather than the current model on our site which is you know i pay 15 dollars one time i go to class and then i'm done we're gonna to try to move into a world where people actually can buy a 10 class pack and then they you know, sunk the cost into that and are more likely to continue taking class. Yeah, that's interesting. This reminds me of like the coffee app that I use that works for different independent coffee shops. I can like have credit in there and once I do have credit in there, I'm like, well, I might as well keep going yeah. back and using the coffee shops that they Yeah. Have. Yeah. Right, right. Um, in terms of setting up your kind of structure with your co-founders. Um, did you have any kind of particular documents that you used um, in terms of like vesting schedules, equity? Did you go to a lawyer? Like kind of what was your yeah. process in really yeah. like forming that team? Hire an attorney, hire an attorney. I'm gonna say that three times, hire an attorney. <laughs> like I, I would have gotten it so wrong. Um, there was never a huge inclination to try to do it myself. I, I maybe considered it for a second or two, but now that I've gone through the process with the help of a law firm, I'm like laughing at the possibility that I ever would have done it without. They're not just paperwork, they're subject matter expertise and, and they can actually be really valuable in terms of making recommendations, educating you on, you know, what the heck is single trigger acceleration? I don't even know what this means. <laughs> so I learned a lot in the process by working with a law firm. Um, we worked with Cooley, who is a very big established firm in San Francisco. Um, there's many, many out there. And there's actually one firm in Chicago who really specializes in this. And it's, I'm kicking myself for not remembering the name, but I will drop it in the chat before we sign off. Um, and it's not as expensive as you think. That's the other thing I would add. A, a lot of law firms have the right strategic standpoint on realizing that if they do incorporation for you at a competitive rate, then they get your business, you know, for the life cycle of your company. So it's, it's not more than one to 2000. Cool. So this topic kind of at the event today was more about, you know, building your product and, and launching, but we do have a couple questions about sort of speaking a little bit to funding and, and kind of how you're approaching that now, if you have any, any insights to share there. Yeah. So we are actively fundraising, but, Again, we're, we've been live for two months, so we're, we're very early in this process. So I'm probably not the best subject matter expert to give advice in terms of somebody who has successfully fundraised. But if whoever asked is also fundraising, I would gladly have a glass of wine with you and, and commiserate over how difficult the process is. Um, I, I think for us, where what I have learned is I think that in the first several weeks of actively fundraising, I was not being as strategic or intentional as I should have been about who I reached out to. And so I think what that led to was a lot of meetings where after the fact, I kind of realized like I was clearly too early for this company or I, this was clearly not the right fit for me. I, I probably should have been more intentional and targeted about who I reached out to. So I think that we're now, even in the last week, we're getting better positive signs of things going places in the last week because we're being more intentional about the types of firms that we speak to. Thank you. Um, jumping back to kind of an MVP question, um, how basic or kind of scrappy, as they said, was your first MVP? What was the kind of the core feature you focused on getting right? Yeah, so we're still on our first MVP. We are working on version two, which is very exciting. So extremely scrappy. And again, on these no code platforms, I have been amazed in a very positive way by how high the quality is. I mean, it has its limitations, but you can really get a high quality product that your customers perceive positively 
on a no-code platform. And so for us, the, the basic, I guess, requirements that the first version had to have were it had to handle booking and payment, obviously, waiver collection, which is super important for fitness. And so it had to have, you know, all these mechanisms on a class page, an instructor had to have a profile page, and then ultimately there had to be a marketplace browse experience. But so many things about our product are not glamorous and, and I feel deeply embarrassed by them. But the funny thing that I'm learning is your customers don't notice. And we did, we actually did a customer interview, um, customer meaning not an instructor in this case, an actual customer who has taken a class. We did an interview the other day and she was like praising our site and how usable it is. And I'm sitting here like, I'm sorry, what? Like our, to give one very specific example, we can't control the order that classes show up in on our browse page. And so you would think that you're going to land on a browse page and you're going to see a class that's occurring today first. And then the class that's occurring two weeks from now at the very bottom, not on any fit. You're going to see class soup. Like you're going to see just them in the order that they were created with no rhyme or reason. And so that was very painful for me to launch that and know like, gosh, this browse experience is just horrible for customers. Has a single customer pointed that out to me or has it had business impact? Absolutely not. And so this comes back to that notion of, perfect is the enemy of good enough. Mm -hmm. You know, you can really get started with something that's good enough and get a lot more traction than you would expect. Can you share the name of the no code platform that you're using? And do you think, do you plan to kind of continue to use platforms like that or will eventually you utilize a developer? Yeah. So we're on sharetribe.com um, to, to drop a few other ones that we looked at. Bubble is also a really well-known platform. Um, Shoop, which is S H U U P or a Dallow. Um, and, and there's like way more, there's a whole world of these things out there. So for us, it was the absolute perfect solution because we were optimizing for getting into market quickly. So mm -hmm. we actually had a fully functional product in under a week, believe it or not. Um, however, where we're at today is the ceiling of that initial MVP was very low. And so it's not very customizable. And I, I gave the example earlier of wanting to sell bundles of class packs because we think that it'll make customers stickier. We can't do that on the current platform that we're on. So we're in the process of migrating right now to what is actually another no-code platform. It's just one that allows for a little bit more customization. Um, so, so it's really about, and what I will admit is a challenge about this is it's hard to shop for these things because it's, you can't see your own product. It's hard to demo it, I guess is what I'm saying. It's hard to picture your own product in the templates on these websites. So it's not necessarily an easy process, but the benefit that you're getting from going this route, like I said, is being able to get into market in a really quick and inexpensive way. Great. I think that's about it on our questions and we will be sending a follow-up email. So Cheryl and I can connect on resources for everyone and send a note out with, the 50 questions for your co-founder um, and just the, the name of the book that Cheryl mentioned, things like that um, to make sure everyone has those resources. But before we sign off, or is there anything else you'd like to share? Or thank you so much for spending your time with us today. Yeah, thank you. This was fun to, to relive some of these memories. It's like, I know this was only two months ago, but it feels like it feels like two years ago and a time that I'm now very nostalgic about. So this was a great chat. Awesome. Thank you so much. And thank you all for joining us. And yeah, it's been good. Thank you. Thanks, Kelly. Bye, everyone.